Hello everyone. Thank you for attending today's Watershed Webinar, Introduction to the Chesapeake Bay and Watershed. Our presenter is Mr. Alan Hammond, a retired AP environmental science teacher. Okay, uh, today we're gonna explore uh, introduction to Chesapeake Bay uh, watershed system. Um, let's see, I need to. I'm kind of new to this, so this is my first webinar, so you have to kind of bear with me here. Okay, um, we'll be looking at the Chesapeake Bay itself down here, and uh, also mostly the watershed itself. Uh, the watershed of the Chesapeake Bay uh, has six states involved, starting in North New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, very little bit of Delaware, Virginia, and a very little bit right in here of West Virginia, okay? There's 64,000 square miles in the watershed, and it pretty much has a funneling effect with all these rivers that funnel all the surface water toward the Chesapeake Bay, which is about 4,000 square miles of surface area. Uh, the other thing about the Chesapeake Bay, it's a fairly shallow bay. Uh, there is a deep channel that runs down the center of it, making it possible for ocean going ships to come in as far up as Baltimore to unload cargo. But they always tell you, if you fall out of a boat in the Chesapeake Bay, try to stand up. 80% uh, of it's less than six feet deep. So um, just a, you know, a few quick things about that. Uh, I'm gonna switch over now to uh, another map. Bear with me for a minute here. Okay, here we go. Okay, we'll talk about just for a brief few minutes here. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay and the watershed, where did it come from? Uh, during the last ice age, of course, all of Canada, as you can see in the map here, was covered uh, with ice. And when that ice and so on melted, it created all the lakes, including, of course, the Great Lakes here. Uh, and if you look at Pennsylvania, you could almost drop Pennsylvania into Lake Superior. So these, when they titled them Great Lakes, they definitely are Great Lakes, okay? So um, Pennsylvania itself, wasn't uh, just the northern tier counties were glaciated. So as all that water melted and worked, you know, moved southward, it carved out the uh, Susquehanna River Basin and basically all the drainage. Uh, sea level was 200 feet lower at the time. And uh, the that's what the Susquehanna River pretty much carved out what we see as the existing Chesapeake Bay. Now, after the ice age was over, and sea level came up 200 feet, it flooded pretty much that whole Susquehanna, lower end of the Susquehanna River Valley and formed the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, uh, the Chesapeake Bay itself, if we zoom in, zoom in on it here, uh, begins uh, at Harvard de Grace, Maryland, right in here, and um, is 200 miles long as it would go down and it would exit here at Norfolk or Virginia Beach. Okay, uh, narrowest point on the Chesapeake Bay would be somewhere, it's somewhere around three miles right here in Annapolis. If you've ever gone to Ocean City and gone through Annapolis, of course you cross over the Bay Bridge. And of course, if you're gonna build a bridge, you wanna go to the shortest expanse. That's the narrowest point right there, about three miles. Uh, Bay Bridge goes over to Kent Island and then from there on across to what they call the Eastern Shore. This whole area is referred to as the Delmarva Peninsula. Okay, Delaware, Maryland and Virginia occupied in that peninsula. Okay, so um, the Chesapeake Bay importance and history. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, at the end of the ice age, uh, somewhere along the line, of course, there were a lot of Native Americans. When the first people came over from Europe, there were tribes all around. That's where you, you find the, the names like Susquehanna, 
uh, Mattapani, Potomac, Rappahannock, these are all Native American uh, names and so on, lived along the shores, pretty much with the bay, 80% of the bay being less than six feet deep, it was easy for them to find food there. And uh, pretty much individual tribes would occupy the smaller watersheds uh, as, they, as you would see them on the map here. First European contact came in, uh, Captain John Smith sailed, English captain sailed up the Chesapeake Bay and kept pretty good records and for 1608 of what the Chesapeake Bay was like. Uh, the, the oyster reefs were so big in the bay they had to sail around them. Uh, there were crabs and all kinds of food. And uh, he said this would be a good place to, you know, for the English to start a settlement. So shortly thereafter, they came in at Jamestown down here in the lower end with the very first European settlement in the Bay Area. For some reason, uh, which I don't really understand, uh, the, the, it died out. Uh, some people said they were starving and, and so on. I don't see how in less than six feet of water with crabs and oysters and clams and fish everywhere, how you would starve, but apparently uh, that's pretty much uh, what happened. Okay, so getting back to a little bit on the geography of it here. Uh, Narrows points three down here at the in this area here. Uh, it's about 20 miles wide, right across from the Potomac here. Um, in the 1990s, when we started teaching environmental science at Allegheny High School in Cumberland, I partnered with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Uh, they provided educational opportunities for the students of, of Maryland. And uh, we would take three day field trips to the islands down here on their education sites. Uh, you could you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, Saturday, Sunday, Monday trips. Uh, we come down, of course, cross the Bay Bridge and go out to Salisbury. Everybody, it's been to Ocean's, Ocean City, Maryland, you know, pretty much going that route. And then go south through Cambridge and so on over to Salisbury and then down to Chrisfield, which is right here. Uh, one of the state routes goes out to Chrisfield. We get on a boat and go out to either Smith Island, which has a population. People will live full time on Smith Island, mostly involved in crabbing industry and or Tangier Island, which is a little further to the south here. The uh, Chesapeake Bay web or, uh, site was on East Point Marsh. They have uh, dorm buildings and other buildings there to accommodate up to 25 students at a time. So pretty good trips. I ran uh, 25 trips in 20 years from 1995 to the time I retired in 2015. Not because I had to, because I loved doing it with the kids. Kids had a blast uh, getting down to the Chesapeake. But you can see how wide it is here at Tangier. Tangier Sound at Smith Island is pretty big. Uh, Chrisfield itself has history. They claim that most of the town of Chrisfield's built on oyster shells from back in the day uh, when they harvested a lot of oysters out of the Chesapeake. Okay, so back up here a little bit. Okay, so the total length of the Chesapeake Bay would be about 200 miles down. It'd be like driving from Pittsburgh to Harrisburg, you might say, uh, all along the way. And it's a uh, little over 4,000 square miles. It's the biggest estuary in the world, really, um, because of all the extra shoreline you get from like coming up the Potomac River, uh, the rapid, they call this the Tappahannock. I think it's also the Rappahannock there and so on. Okay, so the importance, present day importance of the bay. Uh, when we start in the north, uh, we have the city of Baltimore of over 2 million people. Oh, wait, a minute. I forgot to do some more of the, some more of the history. Okay, some of the history involved. Um, in the, during the Revolutionary War, somehow the, uh, the the war ended up down here at uh, close to Jamestown. Uh, the British had came out onto one of these what they call heads, and uh, General Washington had them cut off right there. They were supposed to get on ships and, and of course English ships, but the English were defeated in a in a battle out in the Atlantic Ocean, and the French sealed off the harbor right here. So when General Cornwallis had nowhere to go, all he could do was surrender. 
And that was the end of the Revolutionary War. So that ended on the shores basically of the, of the Chesapeake Bay, clear down here close to the mouth, okay? Uh, when the British came back in the War of 1812, they used Tangier Island, the island I just showed you, as a staging area for um, moving up. Let's see if we get back here. They moved up the Potomac River, of course, to Washington, D.C., and burnt the White House. And of course, the, uh, they weren't ready for the British to come up and uh, burnt the White House and kind of ransacked the whole uh, city as it was at that time. They then tried to move up towards, they were going to do the same thing at Baltimore, but uh, Baltimore was pretty much ready for them after they found out what happened at Washington. And um, they sunk ships in the har in, outside the harbor. And of course, during the Battle of Fort McHenry, the Star Spangled Banner was written. Uh, they tried to attack people from Baltimore, but they, the British were repelled and they left left the Chesapeake Bay and, and went down to New Orleans, basically, as time went on. Okay, uh, battles of the Civil War fought in the, in the watershed, of course, starting in the North Urban Ace Battle of Gettysburg within the, within the Susquehanna watershed. Uh, Antietam Creek was just south of Hagerstown. Uh, Winchester, Maryland over here changed, or Virginia changed hands. I don't know how many times during the uh, civil uh, during the Civil War. Uh, eventually, as time went on towards the end of the war, the Battle of Richmond, Fredericksburg, Richmond is right here. Uh, Battle of Richmond. Once it was settled, the General Lee moved his army down to Appomattox. Was at the, it's at the very lower end. It's not on the map here, but it's at the very lower end. And the surrender <laughs> to Civil War took place at that at that point. Okay. Um, so that all happened within pretty much in the watershed of the Chesapeake Bay, which if you're interested in history, that's some uh, pretty neat stuff there. Uh, present day, we start down here at Norfolk, Hampton Roads, Norport, New, Newport News. This is one of the biggest military installations, is the biggest military installation on the eastern seaboard. Uh, if, you, if you haven't been there, you'd find Uh, Lanika, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, no. I Okay, now I can hear it. Say something. Okay. Yeah, it's something working. seemed, I, yeah, something went off. I got a screen there that, that uh, went off. Okay. So anyway, this is the largest military installation on the eastern seaboard with, uh, you know, nuclear powered submarines, aircraft carriers, and so on, large number of people there. We'll talk about the military there for a second. We've got Fort AP Hill here. Uh, we have Andrews Air Force Base. You got the Patuxent Naval Air Station. You got Quantico. Uh, you got the uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds up here in the north. So it's a there's military all over. It seems like up and down the, the shores. So it's a big part of it. Uh, commerce wise, over a trillion dollars worth of things like automobiles. Uh, I know I bought a tractor that was built in Italy and came in through the Baltimore Harbor a few years back. Uh, Baltimore is a, you know, is a uh, huge destination point for all kinds of products coming in. Okay, uh, then we move on down. Let's see if there's any more history I want to go over. Oh, the other importances of the bay would be, uh, let's check here. Things like uh, the the value of the blue crab harvest every year is worth about 78 million jobs or 78 million dollars and 34,000 jobs uh, which the the harvest there is is pretty phenomenal uh, striped bass 500 million to the economy down there Menhaden about 26 million recreational boating uh, over two billion dollars uh, 32,000 jobs and uh, over 400,000 boats in Maryland and Virginia. That seems to be a lot. Tourism, uh, worth over $15 million. Uh, there's campgrounds, 
sailing up and down the shorelines of the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, so that's some of the, some of the real importance is out there. Okay. Um, anybody have any questions at this point before we move on any further? Okay, yeah, you should be down there. Okay, we'll look at some of the, uh, some of the creatures, but most important uh, fish and other crustaceans and things like Chesapeake Bay. We'll talk about those for, uh, for a few minutes here. Okay, uh, this is a state fish of Maryland. It's a striped bass. They can grow up to 30 to 40 pounds or more. Okay, this is no one that I know. This is just kind of a photo I picked up of one of them. Incredibly good eating fish, very popular uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. But due to overfishing back in the 1980s, the striped bass became fairly extinct in the Chesapeake Bay, with the Chesapeake Bay being the number one spawning ground on the eastern seaboard for the striped bass. So they put a moratorium on striped bass, uh, no fishing until sometime in the 90s, and uh, with a major stocking program, they were able to bring them back. Uh, and uh, like I said, very big, very beautiful fish, silver. So, and extremely good eating. It's a white fish and very mild tasting white fish. They're very highly sought after by sportsmen, not only for the fighting ability of them, but also for, the, for their flavor. Actually, that's me in this picture. Uh, me and my friends for a good many years would go down to Virginia Beach, usually in January, early February, when the females would be lining up outside. We'd uh, go out on a charter boat and we would catch fish comparable to this almost every time we went out. And, uh, a lot of fun. Okay, now here's kind of the, <laughs> kind of the big animal of the uh, Chesapeake, the, the blue crab. Blue crabs are, they estimate that uh, over four, there's over 400 million crabs in the Chesapeake Bay at this point. Uh, they last about three years uh, from the time that they're born until they're harvested. Uh, they need to be five inches between the points right here before they're allowed to be harvested. And actually the blue crab would grow bigger if they were allowed to grow bigger. But as soon as they hit this, it seems like they're taken out and go to market go, you know, to food stores. Okay, this is a, a big male crab. They call it, nicknamed them Jimmy's. Uh, crabs are awesome. They got, they can walk, you know, on the bottom of the bay. They got swimmers, they're very fast swimmers. They can move back and forth and up and down through the column of water. They're pinchers, uh, can rip and tear food. Uh, that, that they can eat. Uh, they're just uh, pretty awesome animals. Of course, the hard shell, hard for predators to bite into them. Uh, these, of course, the striped bass, when the crabs are small, they can eat them, but when one gets this size, they're just this way too big, but highly sought after. Like I said, uh, the crabs, uh, they are very resilient when it comes to the, when it comes to the bay. Now, as the settlers were coming in, going back to that for a second, the Chesapeake Bay's pretty much like a giant aquarium. Uh, you ha have to have your filters in the water to keep the water fairly clear. The uh, submerged aquatic vegetation would do that. Uh, then the other big one would be oysters that are filter feeders. Uh, one oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. I, I find that incredibly amazing. When I take the kids down on field trips, they would put a handful of oysters in a, like a one gallon container, put muddy water in with them. And when you get up the next morning, the water would be clear that the oysters would be filtering that water. Uh, the sad thing is that 1.98% of the oysters that were in the Chesapeake Bay were gone. Uh, there were two diseases they think came from uh, human sewage, MSX and Dermo that, that pretty much killed them off then over harvesting. And then we started getting more sediment and mud in the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. There's a pretty active program right now trying to restore oysters. They are having a good bit of success in certain areas of the bay, but kind of like we were talking about an aquarium, it's like, say you have, an, everybody knows you have a filter in your aquarium. If you try to run an aquarium without a filter, what do you have? You have a bunch of murky, nasty water. And that's kind of what the Chesapeake Bay was getting into if you take the filter feeders out. So, um, 
this uh, male, oops, sorry. Males, their tips look like this. Females, they're called jimmies. The, the waterman, the nickname for them is jimmies. And actually, when you go into the restaurants down there, if you're in a crabbing restaurant, you go to the men's bathroom and it won't say men, it'll say jimmy on the door. And the female crabs are called sooks, S-O-O-K-S. Uh, they got red tips. The watermen always would tell the kids that the females paint their nails red, which is pretty neat, okay? So the jimmies and the sooks, okay, and the crabs. Uh, one that probably no one has ever heard of is the, the menhaden. They come into Chesapeake Bay in the summertime in massive schools. They are not edible. They are very mushy, soft fish. They smell very bad. They're extremely oily, but they are highly sought after. Now, they are a good food source for uh, predatory fish like the uh, striped bass, but menhaden uh, are basically uh, gathered for their oil. They'll send out what they call the mothership. It's a, a giant, well, first they'll send out spotter planes to find out where there's a school of menhaden. Then they send out the mothership and surround the whole school with nets, tighten the nets in, and then use giant kind of like suction cannons. They look like cannons, but of course they're suction in reverse. Suck these ship up on board and they go to Reedville, Virginia. And I'm sure you've all heard of this. They turn, in, turn them into omega-3 uh, protein oil. So the omega-3 capsules uh, is coming from Menhaden. The oil is valuable, but the fish itself is not. Most watermen uh, use the Menhaden to bait crab pots. You rip them apart and uh, then they, the crabs will find their way into the crab pots. Another neat creature of the bay, everybody hears the Maryland terrapin, that's their symbol, of course, but this is what the terrapin really looks like. Actually, I thought the terrapin would be bigger since it's a you know, college mascot, but the, ter the terrapin's not a very big turtle, maybe a little bigger than a box turtle that we'd find in our area here, but they're very uh, pretty turtles, very beautiful turtles. Um, there's one that uh, one of the kids that we found on one of our field trips came up in with the dredging we were doing. Pretty neat coloration on them. Uh, they were almost eaten into extinction. Uh, settlers liked to eat them uh, and they were almost wiped out, but they're back now. We find you find a quite a bit of them down there. Pretty neat little turtles. Okay, there's a good picture of forward facing one of them. SAVs are extremely important to the functioning of the environment. Uh, these are submerged aquatic vegetation, underwater grasses. Uh, the grasses need to have fairly clear water, of course, to carry on photosynthesis. If the water's too murky, the grasses die out. As if the grasses die out, then uh, these for the grasses provide habitat for baby crabs to, to uh, feed, to find cover to keep from getting eaten by predators and for all other kinds of uh, small creatures that might live there. Uh, seahorses, large number of seahorses migrate in out of the uh, Atlantic Ocean, they look for these bay grasses to, of course, with a seahorse tail, they tie onto the uh, seagrass. They are having good success, though, bringing those grasses back, which is pretty neat. Guy here, I just put it on for fun. He's kind of having a little too much fun with the SAVs down there. Uh, here's a pretty sought after fish, a croaker. Um, when they come out of the water, uh, they release gas and they just kind of do a croaking sound. And uh, Sport fishermen like them, although they're not big, they'll put a big battle there. Actually, they were good to eat. Uh, fillet off of each side, put them in an outdoor cooker, bread them, they're good. One of the symbols of Chesapeake Bay uh, is the blue heron, a long legged wading bird, uh, sharp beak to wade in shallow water and spear. They almost ran these fellas into extinction. They used the feathers to stuff mattresses. So they just would kill them indiscriminately to get the feathers off of them to stuff mattresses back in the day. But they're back now. They are in our area. And in some places they are a nuisance because they eat everything in the streams, in the small streams and so on. Uh, I have one very close to my house. He's in the wetlands all the time. He's in my son's ponds all the time. So but they're pretty neat. Uh, there they are in flight, pretty neat birds. I, I took this picture in the 
on one of the islands in the Chesapeake. Brown pelicans have brought their range northward <clears throat> into the Chesapeake. They, they're colonial birds, means they colonize. And there's uh, like large numbers of them you see there in, in the trees there. There's a lot of them. They're mostly a southern bird, but they have come north and they're reproducing up there. Ducks, another big favorite of the Chesapeake Bay. Ducks are fairly simple. They kind of name them after what they look like. This guy's a red-headed duck. Okay. Uh, ducks were very big sport birds uh, back in the day. <clears throat> uh, some of the ducks were facing extinction. Uh, if they're specific feeders, some ducks only feed on, like the widgeon duck only feeds on widgeon grass. He's kind of, his menu's limited. Uh, we see a lot of mallards in our area because they're omnivores, they eat all kinds of stuff. But um, Chesapeake's known for a lot of ducks. These are pintail ducks. I can't see it because of the picture there, but they have a sharp pointed tail out the back there. Uh, this is a canvas back. They thought it looked like a white piece of canvas. Oh, canvas back there. Uh, here's Tangier. This is what Tangier Island looks like. Um, only about a thousand people live on Tangier. I don't know how many soldiers in 1812 the British had on their camping on here, but uh, they do have an airstrip for emergencies. We'll take smaller planes and helicopters could land there if they have, if they have emergency. This is the main street of town. Uh, there's no cars on the island. They drive golf carts. That's about it. And then all these are there crabbing boats and fishing boats that are docked out here, you know, uh, for, and they don't, uh, when they are ready to sell the crabs that they catch, a, a by boat from the mainland comes over once a week on Saturday and picks up the crabs off them. So these folks never leave the island too much. And they have a specific dialect that was studied by linguists. And they said that, uh, throughout the last several hundred years, they've They've never mixed with the American population and their, their English accent has stayed with them. So that's kind of interesting to talk to them. Like instead of saying crab, they say crab, okay? And if the water's calm, they'll call it a slick cam. They have, they have a little bit of uh, variance in their languages, which is pretty neat. Okay, so we'll move on to the next group here. Okay, so let's talk about um, Chesapeake Bay. The biggest problem with it right now is the increasing population. In the 1940s, there were about 3 million people lived in the Chesapeake Bay, as I showed you on the, on the map there a little bit ago. Uh, last time I'd heard the number was 17 million and a website I'm gonna show you here shortly, they said it, that has topped 18 million now. Uh, when I first started going to the bay in the 90s, the, the population was 11 million. So in 20 years, we've gone from 11 million to let's say 18 million. Uh, that creates a lot of anything from air pollution from driving cars to sewage from 18 million people to agricultural issues and so on. Uh, but the way Pennsylvania stands here, uh, fortunately, this is the Susquehanna River Basin right here. The largest cities and most of the population lie outside the Susquehanna Basin. Uh, they are right next door to us where we're sitting right now. Uh, you run into the Ohio Basin pretty quick, which you know goes through uh, three rivers of Pittsburgh and down into the Mississippi. So everything that's kind of in green here is in the Ohio Basin. It doesn't affect the Chesapeake Bay whatsoever. On the eastern, I'm sure you're seeing everybody's pictures over here on the side. This is the Delaware Basin that forms the jagged line along eastern Pennsylvania, the Delaware River. Philadelphia, which is the largest city in the state, is over there. So it goes into the Delaware River, so it's not going into the Chesapeake Bay. So this is mostly a thing of central Pennsylvania. Now, um, so if, let's say, what I would always tell the kids is if you would get in a canoe, let's say out here in the Ohio Basin, and you just floated with the water, you would end up in Pittsburgh and all the way in the Gulf of Mexico. But if you would get in a canoe in our area, you'd float, you'd eventually end up in the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, so now here's a, another picture of watershed. I think we talked a lot about that at that point, so we'll move on. Uh, most of you that 
are participating today are uh, in the Blair County, uh, Huntington County area, so on. So uh, they've divided the Susquehanna River Basin into uh, the different branches here. Most of us live in the Juniata Basin down here is where we're gonna go. And then the biggest, the major part of the Susquehanna is in the lower Susquehanna Basin down by Harrisburg, York, Lancaster, the big cities in that area. Um, the basin goes clear up to Cooperstown, New York, home of the Baseball Hall of Fame is actually in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which imagine that goes up there quite a ways into New York. So that's, that's pretty neat. But nonetheless, you have to wonder do pollutants and so on from Clare, but Cooperstown and Binghamton make it the whole way to the Chesapeake Bay. I don't, you know, that, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So we're gonna look at this area right here where we live. This is the Juniata Basin. Stop there momentarily. Um, if you, some of you I saw were from uh, Hollidaysburg area. Um, and uh, some of you, uh, somebody was on the list, I think, from Penn Cambrian. So you're basically outside the Chesapeake Bay Basin. You'd be over into the uh, Ohio watershed. But the uh, Eastern Continental Divide is on the edge of the, of the watershed up here. It'd be the mountains just to the west of us, or where you guys are in Hollidaysburg and out and so on. Okay. So for Bedford people, uh, the water would come down, flow down this way. And then it cuts north down by just below Everett. Oh, closer. OK, OK. Um, it would be the water would flow north into the uh, Raystown Dam, which is a good nutrient trap, phosphate nitrate trap. Uh, it comes out the other side, picks up, the, goes into the Juniata River here, and eventually flows north towards Lewistown and into, into the uh, Susquehanna, just north of Harrisburg. Okay, and then on its way to the bay. So, um, in Altoona, you'd have the Frankstown branch of the Juniata flowing through here. Uh, Martinsburg, you have Clover Creek that flows north and so on. So it's kind of interesting. A lot of people seem to think rivers need to flow south. They don't. We have a good example. Most of the rivers in our basin are flowing kind of to the northeast with the curvature of the mountains and so on. Okay, here's the Harrisburg. Uh, Basin here, Harris, Harrisburg, York, Lancaster. Uh, you know, when you go across the bridges at Harrisburg, the size of the Susquehanna River is pretty amazing. And uh, it's from all the water flowing. Everything that's coming out of the rest of the, the Susquehanna Basin goes right through Harrisburg. About an 80 mile trip down to Harvard de Grace in Maryland. Okay. And talk about so some human impacts on the Chesapeake on the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, we were working with Bedford with Chestnut Ridge School District. Chesapeake Bay watershed drainage basin, 64,000 square miles. I had last figure I had was 17 million. Or I'll show you a website here shortly. You say an 18 million. Um, Susquehanna Basin in Pennsylvania, 27,500 square miles, or 43 percent of the total watershed, with about 4 million people. Okay, so. With that said, if there's 18 million, 4 million people, we're not an overcrowded watershed, okay? Uh, figures, Blair County would have 121,000 residents, Bedford 48,000, Huntington 45,000, and Fulton 14,000. So sources of pollutants that may affect water quality could be coming from residential, could be coming from, our, could be coming from uh, sewage coming out of your house, could be from uh, garbage. Lawn chemicals uh, be common sources. Agriculture would be fertilizers, animal sewage, and chemicals that are used in the rivers, lakes, and streams. Uh, industrial could be chemicals, smokestacks, emissions, and so on. Uh, municipal, uh, we're just going to hit this lightly. Uh, Jim Eckenred will be, he worked with the uh, Blair Conservation District. Uh, he'll be talking about storm runoff and stormwater management in and around urban areas uh, in one of the later webinars. Uh, and then the airshed, uh, during rain events, pollutants from uh, burning fossil fuels can be washed onto the watershed, nitrates, uh, other, and, and can work their way into the rivers, lakes, and streams, and ultimately into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, acid mine drainage in our 
region in the in our sub basin, there's not a lot of coal mining. There was some down in Bedford County back in the day. A lot of the acid mine drainage is coming from abandoned coal mines from back in the day. You might say 100 years ago, back to 1930s, 40s, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, Saxon Broadtop area in Bedford County. Uh, but fortunately, most of the coal mining was outside the uh, Chesapeake Bay watershed for, the, for us. Uh, one of the biggest problems is eutrophication. Nitrates and phosphates can come from human and animal sewage. Uh, nitrogen and phosphorus are basically fertilizers and also some from car emissions. The nutrients cause an explosion of algae growth in the water columns. It could be in the streams and the lakes. I know Shawnee Lake has had a lot of trouble with those up above Bedford with, it. Oh, with this problem. Uh, the algae eventually dies decomposing. Bacteria consume the dissolved oxygen and it's in the water column and can suffocate, can cause fish kills and other organisms. They've had problems with this, with this in the Chesapeake Bay itself. Uh, every year they look for what's called dead zones. I was on a research vessel on a teacher training trip at uh, Solomon Island, and we would, they would drop basically a house water pump uh, and keep dropping it. We would take water samples till we found where the oxygen level in the water was at zero. Uh, now, fin fish can swim out of it, crabs can get out of it, but if you happen to get a, a dead zone with zero oxygen and you have oysters or other creatures that can't move, then they're gonna be suffocated, they're gonna die out. And uh, that's one of the big concerns down there. Okay, I think we can skip this. Uh, so here, this must be an older slide that I picked up on. Uh, Municipal sewage, uh, discharge of untreated nitrates and phosphates throughout the watershed. One of the good things is they're using what's called tertiary treatment. Nitrates and phosphates are being removed from the effluent coming from the sewage treatment plants before it hits the streams. Uh, we don't use phosphates in detergents anymore. They'll, they'll tell you on the box of laundry soap that it's phosphate free. Uh, nitrogen produced by cars and trucks and factories, catalytic converters can help eliminate some of that, but we still get some from, you know, coming off. Uh, natural runoff, nitrates and phosphates, uh, manure runoff from feedlots. Now, agriculture can be a problem there, uh, but if we fence our cattle away from rivers and streams, then that is not really a problem. Um, but they will say that, they will tell you by the, from the Chesapeake Bay that agriculture is still the number one source of pollution going into the bay. Runoff from streets and construction sites you can have some nitrate phosphate there. Uh, people that like to fertilize their lawns. Uh, lawn fertilizer is primarily 48% nitrogen, uh, miracle Grow, and things like that. Or if you have lawn care companies come in, uh, if that isn't taken up by the grass and gets washed off and into the streams, it can cause a problem. So you have an overload of nutrients that can cause what's called dead zones. They can the decomposition of algae can take the oxygen out of the water pretty much. Okay, one way to help rivers and streams would be by riparian buffer zones. There are areas of permanent vegetation adjacent to water bodies uh, and they can help trap trees. You know, just think of the size of the trees and numbers of them along this stream. The roots of the trees will uptake nitrates and phosphates and other types of chemicals. Uh, carry on photosynthesis, release, uh, use up the carbon dioxide and so on, release oxygen in the air, um, and use the runoff maybe from this agricultural field where they could probably take up most of the nitrate and phosphate that might be headed for this stream. So a uh, big push on throughout Chesapeake Bay watershed to uh, increase riparian buffer zones. Uh, my, my students at school, we would get involved in helping plant seedling trees in the spring with the DNR forestry division. Uh, it was kind of a neat project for us to do. Throughout the course of about 20 years, we planted lots of seedling trees. Nice riparian buffer zone here. Um, talk about combined sewer overflows. I'm sure uh, Jim Eckenrode is going to talk about this. Uh, back in the day, they just combined the sewer and the kind of storm water around cities, they put it together and would run it straight through the sewage treatment plants. Uh, during you know, flood type periods, they 
storm water would overflow and carry sewage right out into the rivers, lakes, and streams. Now, 70% of the drinking water in the United States comes directly from surface water. So uh, they, when we toured the treatment plant in Cumberland, Maryland, they told us back in the day, they'd be told to shut off, shut down their intake valves of water from the river, uh, you know, in times of flooding because of the sewage that might be in the water and so on. So heavy rain flooding can overflow, overflow those treatment plants. Okay, so some solutions um, could be separating the storm sewer and storm lines, but that's expensive and trying to dig up the city streets to do that would, is, is a problem. But whenever you consider an inch of rain over an acre of ground is 27,000 gallons. There's 640 acres of a square mile, do the math. It's a massive amount of water that would be coming down through, through the system there. Okay. Okay, uh, anybody have any questions on anything at this point? We have about, just about 10 minutes left, am I right? We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, we were to have a question answer period if anybody would like to ask any questions on anything. If you have questions, please unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can post it in the chat. Yeah, so you can see if they have any questions. Well, while there are no questions, Alan, maybe you can continue. Maybe people will have questions in a minute or so. Oh, M E N H A D E N. Alan, there is a question. Yeah, yeah, we had a question. I think it was the Menhaden. Is that the one that they were asking about? H A D E N. No. After the terror. Okay, tell me. Hold on a second. I'll have to bring that slide back up for it. So I can't. Uh, okay. Fish. Oh, Kroger. C R O A K E R. A K A K E R. Is this a fish that we were asking about? The name of it, Kroger. Okay. I have a quick question. Okay. When uh, about 15 years ago, we lived down near in Maryland near the Inner Harbor, and the water in the harbor looked disgusting. Like you could see oil on it and garbage. Like has that? I don't know if you've been there recently. Has that changed? Have they been, like put regulations in place trying to clean it up, or is it still probably the same in the harbor? The stuff just collect there. I'm, get, I'm guessing it's the same. Uh, I had a group of students on a field trip. We were going out on the bay on one of their uh, skipjacks. And we got there about six o'clock in the morning. And it was, it kind of surprised me. There were one man skimmer boats. They had like big baskets on the front of them. They were driving around in the inner harbor collecting the uh, Burger King bags and drink cups and so on, just skimming the stuff they had a rainstorm upstream the night before and it washed those things down into the bay and you know with the city streets of baltimore and so on i i guess that's just the way it is you know they make it look pretty good but it it's actually you know they pick up the paper and everything that's floating in the water but the chemicals that's in the water i'm sure they're not getting so yeah i was surprised at how how polluted the water looked it was pretty obvious it was polluted yeah. it was yeah bad. Yeah, they, like I said, they just, they, if they didn't skim the plastic, you know, the uh, 
plastic cups and bags and so on off the water, it would really be bad. But uh, you, you're right, it, it, it just doesn't look, it's not clean. Now, the bay itself, due to the amount of sediment and so on, uh, the bay never was, you know, pristine. Well, back in the day before anybody lived there, you know, when the Native Americans there, yeah, probably was. Oh, there's one thing I wanted to show before, I almost forgot this, this is extremely important. I wanted you guys to see this before we go. Uh, I need to get on to I almost forgot. This is this is something that you could really use. I almost forgot to show it to you. Let's see what we have here. Do we explore? Here's a website called the Chesapeake Bay Program. Uh, I got carried away there talking about some of that other stuff. Um, this is an updated website that will, you know, can teach you about the bay. In fact, if you were going to do anything, maybe with students in class, facts and figures about the bay. There's a nice picture of the Chesapeake Bay with the sailing boats. So here you talk about everything that I mentioned, 200 mile long, the width of the bay, so on, uh, seaports, shoreline, and all that. It's it's interesting. Um, field guides for animals, you know, whatever you're looking for there, birds, fish, what have you, uh, about the issues. They have some pretty neat things here. Um, how agriculture affects, you know, like if you would, like you click on that and uh, they have some little short videos. Here's a guy, we won't have time to watch all this, but here's the agriculture's number one pollutant gone into the bay. Oh, you can't hear it? Wonder why. Okay. Okay. Uh, Michael said we can't hear it, but they're there. They're interesting little tidbits of uh, information. One anywhere from a minute to maybe five minutes long. Uh, if you're interested in uh, blue crab populations, um, stormwater runoff. I wonder what happened why it wouldn't play. I'm sure there is, um, NOAA might have one, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration in Cambridge might have something like that. But here's little uh, issues like you could, if you click on these, there may be or may not be a little video with it, but uh, some things underwater grasses, wastewater wetlands, how all these things are valuable. Uh, here's one on the Conowingo Dam. Didn't get to mention that. This dam was built, oh, years ago. Don't know the exact time. Purpose was it was for it was to collect sediment coming down it's rated Harvard de Grace, right where the Susquehanna River flows into the Chesapeake Bay. It's there to collect sediment, which is a, is a major problem in the Chesapeake Bay. And what has happened over the period of time the dam has been there, it's almost full of sediment, and they may not be getting much value out of collecting sediment anymore because it's almost completely full of sediment. So I don't know what they're gonna, uh, what the plan is to, to do with that or whatever, but uh, still, you know, sediment's a major problem in the in the Chesapeake Bay. Here they have the overview on what it's a hydroelectric generating station, but it's also a sediment trap, and talks about the impact on water quality and so on. Uh, so this is this is a good website. I don't know if you if you guys have to write any papers to get your uh, credit for you know you know watching these webinars or not, but you could you know, get a lot of information from that website. And it is up to date. Uh, it's, it's you know, pretty good in terms of that. Any questions on any of that? Okay. I, I have one more question. Sure, yeah. Um, you mentioned how sediment is a huge problem in the Chesapeake. Um, now, 
would that still be a problem without human impact? Like humans make a lot of other types of pollution with runoff and eutrophication, that sort of thing. But would sediment still be a problem even if we weren't around? I would say not near as much because uh, if when before we came, it was completely forested watershed. You know, and you'd have your tree roots and your forests, uh, you know, in the, you know, in and around particularly uh, in the region of Harrisburg and South and Lancaster and York, where all those huge agricultural fields were, they, they would have been forested prior to, you know, European settlement. Fields were cleared and then that, that starts it. Yeah. So, no, um, actually pictures that I've seen, video clips that I've seen back in the 1940s uh, with only 3 million people in the watershed, the bay was pretty clear at the time. They were now probably during severe storms and so on, maybe hurricanes going through. Yeah, you'd probably pick up some sediment, but it wasn't a daily occurrence. You know, it wasn't happening all the time. So it was, it would have been pretty neat to see that ecosystem, the way it was functioning in the, even back say at 1800 or 1850, uh, they really weren't harvesting that much out of the bay. And uh, it was just a, a balanced out, pretty much a balanced out ecosystem. Pretty neat. All right. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, with that, we are coming up on the end of our hour. So I thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I realized with the tech, with the computers, we had some issues with the, uh, the, the screens there. I apologize for that. Um, but I put the Act 48 form in the um, chat. So please fill that out and provide feedback. And um, we hope to see you at future sessions. The next one will be on March 24th. Ask them if they need a copy of the notes. Oh, it sounds like your audio is better than mine, so you can say it. Oh, OK. Uh, would any of you need to copy of the notes of things that we talked about today, if you need to write a paper or anything for your, uh, for your credit for today or okay. not? Uh, you could probably get anything that you might need off of the Bay Program website, or I could, you know, we could send you a copy of the notes. So but that's up to you. Yeah, we can get it to them. Okay. You can say, like, an email. Yeah, we can, yeah, they can send it to you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending and um, enjoy your day. <laughs>